Scott Fickner, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Overrule Podcast brought to you by Scott Vignair Law Firm. It is a great day in New Orleans, and my usual co-host, Brad Scott, is too good for us. He's in Italy this week on an Italian adventure with his wife, Liz. I'm kidding. A much-deserved vacation for Brad. And so welcome to the podcast, to one of our senior litigation attorneys, a good friend of mine, um, and a great member of the firm, Caitlin Carrigan, who's going to co-host today's episode with me. Very glad to be here. Brad's loss is my game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have, uh, we're have we going to jump straight into our hot topics for today, and we've got some really, really interesting topics to, for you today to discuss, and I'm going to dive headfirst into mine, Caitlin. You know, it's funny, Kyle came off office this morning and was like, I'm pretty sure I know what you're talking about today, because... The Live Golf PGA Tour DP World Tour merger. How do I not talk about this? This is the big, big news just broke yesterday morning. Um, for those of you who don't know that much about it, about, I assume it was nearly about a year and a half ago, um, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, which is usually referred to as the PIF, um, invested in something called the Live Tour and created a competing golf tour to the tr- two primary principal golf tours, which at the time were the PJ uh, of America Tour and then the DP World Tour, which was a controlling entity of the European Tour, um, etc. Back in the day when Live was started and people who follow golf remember all the controversy was people like Dustin Johnson, Brooks Kepka, big stars on the PJ Tour who left to go to live and got huge paydays, talking hundreds of millions of dollars, guaranteed to go play, which wasn't really dependent on their performance like it is in the PJ Tour, but were guaranteed significant monies and went to live, um, which was a totally different format. The PGA Tour was team golf, et cetera. Um, and, and that's been controversy for y- over a year now. Would Hideki... M- Matsuyama Go, who was the big, big market for Asian golf, um, who's on the PGA Tour, would live lure him away, could live lure away Rory or Tiger, the big PGA players. Um, And it's been an ongoing battle on who would stay with PGA, who would go to live. Just for those of you who don't know, the Public Investment Fund is an investment front for the Saudi Arabian government, um, which is the owner of the biggest oil company in the world, or Saudi Aramco, and has hundreds of billions of dollars at its disposal for various investments. It's invested some of its biggest holdings in the U.S. economy are Uber, Salesforce, Meta, FedEx, uh, Lucid, one of the upstart competitor competitors to Tesla. And so the PIF started this tour and then fired off in our arena a federal lawsuit in the Northern District of California and a trust lawsuit against the PGA Tour. Well, and David, if I can interrupt you there sure. before you get to the fun legal component. <laughs> my And for our listeners, um, David promised me that I wouldn't have to talk about sports today, but because this is a little <laughs> bit of a sexier sports topic, I agreed. My understanding of what PIF really looks at investing in is kind of a disruptor so that they aim to invest and live as, to disrupt specifically what has been a more traditional industry being the PGA Golf Tour, which is – For some of us who are not as familiar as David, it's a bit antiquated or traditional in that sense, whereas Liv came in and disrupted the whole scene of golf. Is that fair to say? Well, uh, that's a fair... That's what my 12-year-old tells me anyway, so I I figured that was a good recitation (laughs) of what it was. He's a pretty smart 12-year-old, so he doesn't necessarily... I don't think he's wrong. Um, I have, if if we're going to get into personal opinions on that, I think this... This topic hits so many different issues. It's not just legal issues, which will run through some of the lawsuits that were pending and maybe some of the new lawsuits that we may see. Um, But we're really, this also hits on antitrust issues with the Department of Justice, um, whether the Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, would approve this merger, which is all delving and hitting into this, this pit of like geopolitical issues related to Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, Iran, um, and, and, and our country's level of comfort of having certain amounts of investment from the PIF, which also then hits all kind of hot button issues related to the clear and unmiscapable murder of Kamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist by 
the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. And this was, it seems that it was not that long ago. I think it was about four years ago in 2018 when he was basically cut up at an embassy in, um, I, I don't know, I forget the country that he was murdered in um, by the Saudi Arabian government. And I'm pretty confident that our CIA has like clearly established that they were responsible for his murder. And as well as hitting on hot button issues, obviously related to the 9-11 families who still don't feel like Saudi Arabia was brought to account on the deaths of their relatives in 9-11, which is a, a sensitive and hot button issue. Um, and so, yes, I would say the PIF does see itself as a disruptor, but I think I think I have like a skeptical view of it from the standpoint of like, I don't think that Saudi Arabia, if you're looking at what is their end game with all of this stuff, what's the big picture? Is it really investment? Sure, they want to make money, but they're never going to run out of money as long as the world uses oil because they own Aramco. No, I, I think the latest estimate of what PIF was worth was $620 billion. That's billion <laughs> with a B. Um, so, and he had, they, PIF has been quoted as saying, or the representative PIF has been quoted as saying that money is really not an issue. And when they were recruiting a lot of the PGA members, correct me if I'm wrong, but money was not an issue. That was no. the, the big draw in, in leaving the PGA to go to live. And if I'm remembering some of the conflict between PJ and Liv that formed the basis of the the lawsuits, the players' lawsuits, was that some of the PR that the PGA used to basically attack Liv and prohibit the players from playing in any of the PGA tours was because of the Saudi Arabia connection. Um, and they just kept calling it the the Saudi golf team was what was quoted yeah. a lot. Yeah. So Jay Moynihan, who's the chairman um, uh, or the the essentially representative and, and director of the entire PGA, which has a board and different um, executive officers, C-suite officers, he you know is getting raked over the coals right now because back in June of 2022, multiple interviews um, with him essentially shaming the players who went to live and attacking live for their 9-11 connections and um and kind of hitting them from this superior per perceived position of the moral high ground like it, you're dirty taking their money and not just him saying it if you go to the lawsuit in the northern district of california their lawyers in the counterclaim so live sued originally sued and there's multiple lawsuits now which people may not I'll be honest, as a lawyer and a golf fan, like I was unaware that there were multiple lawsuits other than the one in the Northern District of um, California. There were there are now four federal cases pending associated with all of these allegations. But what it all started with was the one lawsuit that Liv filed in the Northern District of California, claiming that the PGA Tour of America was a monopoly and violated American antitrust laws. I read an article, I think they put monopoly in their complaint like 115 times, that word. And then PGA Tour counterclaimed against the PIF, um, Al Ramayan and Liv and made various claims against them um, in that un underlying proceeding in the Northern District of California. Since then, there's been a discovery dispute that spun out into the Northern District of Virginia against McKenna Advisors, who's an American consulting firm to live, and then a separate lawsuit which Liv filed, which I wasn't aware of, in the Southern District of Florida against the DP World Tour um, and was making various claims in that. There's a whole litany of discovery motions that have been being fought in the Northern District of Florida where Liv has refused to comply with the judge's discovery orders and claim sovereign immunity and international law is the fact that they don't have to comply with discovery when they filed the lawsuit. That's convenient. <laughs> we should use that in some of ours. I, know, I was like, the PGA's lawyers must have been salivating. Oh, so you get to file a lawsuit, but then when we issue certain issues of discovery, you raise sovereign immunity and international law as a basis not That's to have one. to comply. I'll use that one tomorrow. <laughs> So, but it's my understanding that in this merger that a lot of those lawsuits between the two forces, if you will, are being resolved or mooted by the merger. Not That doesn't apply to the Department of Justice investigation, obviously. Um, but my understanding is that is part of the – was part of the attractiveness of the deal between the two forces. I, I think so. Uh, certainly the, the current lawsuits – and that's something to talk about, right? What would come next if – What's going to come next from a litigation standpoint? From a litigation standpoint, 
obviously, if the parties in all of this litigation are live, the PIF, the PGA Tour, the DP World Tour, Al Ramayan, all of those parties are in favor, it appears, from the initial public reporting of this merger. So those lawsuits will certainly go away, right? It'd be mooted if the merger goes through. However, just to hit on a legal issue before we move on to what lawsuits are potentially to come and what regulatory action could come from the federal government is live is really going to be in an interesting spot now because they in in federal pleadings have assiduously now taken the position that the PGA Tour of America on its own was a monopoly and violated antitrust law I think they call them a golf monolith. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. that's a that's yeah. something that sticks with you. Well, this proposed merger will now take the uh, who they claimed was a monolith and live who was a competitor admittedly and DP World Tour who's a separate entity and merge them all together. So I'm no antitrust lawyer. <laughs> but I do like to think I have a little bit of legal common sense and I I would suspect that the proper party with an appropriate with legal standing is in a unique position to potentially seek an injunction or other type of legal action to stop the merger based on antitrust law issues or sue to break it up after it happens, claiming that now it is a like super monopoly if all of this new entity would control the entire market of golf. Um, and so I don't know where that would fly from, right? Well, and it's kind of for, for a non-golf aficionado, it's kind of strange to think about golf in this context specifically. You know, you think more antitrust when the Department of Justice Department of Justice shot down the Spirit and JetBlue merger. That, to me, is more typical of where you think they would get involved. But here we have golf. You know, it's being played on loop at my house on Saturday and Sundays, and you don't necessarily think that's something the Department of Justice is going to get involved in. But I agree with David wholeheartedly is that from a legal standpoint, you know, they almost don't have a choice. Yeah, I think also the thing to, that's going to be interesting to watch, because we were talking about this, about what Ryan thought about, um, which I'm not making fun of. For y'all who don't know, Ryan is <laughs> Ryan is my oldest son, and um, much to his grandfather's chagrin, is not as interested in golf as he, as he could be, um, <laughs> but is getting there. And this certainly kind of appeals to a little bit of drama, which has been really not present in golf as long as I've known it to be around. Yeah, well, I think the, the thing... Th the aspect of it from the DOJ standpoint is this. I have a skeptical view personally of the PIF. I don't think it's about making money at all. I think it's about strategically placing Saudi Arabia investment in certain assets in unique markets, being Europe and the United States, so that Saudi Arabia over the next 50, 100, and 150 years is making their investments and their country such an integral part of our economy and the fabric of our economy that when there are military or ethnic and, and religious conflicts in that region of the world that will be so leveraged to them that we will have no choice but to make decisions that are based upon economic levers and pressures. Hmm, when did that happen last? Did anybody remember what happened with China and COVID and now we're decoupling or trying to decouple and pull our manufacturing out of China? So that I only comment on that from the geopolitical political perspective, not to necessarily take a side, but to say that's what's going to be discussed at the Department of Justice and whether or not they are going to file antitrust legal action to stop the merger and whether the Securities and Exchange Commission will get involved at either the president or the CIA or the FBI's urging to stop Saudi Arabian investment for whatever geopolitical reason it may be in such a traditional pillar of Americans' economy and way of life as the PGA Tour. So that's why I think there's like so many more dominoes to fall on the legal front from the government, right? The government could certainly stop it or potentially file actions to stop it. And I'm almost 100% confident those conversations are happening with assistant attorneys in the Department of Justice's antitrust division, right? We know that's happening and they're discussing it right now. Um, but I also thought what was interesting is, 
you know, you have the other side of this, like a Tiger Woods who took turned down a reportedly seven hundred and fifty million dollars to go to live. You have Rory McIlroy who turned down reportedly these all reports five hundred million dollars to go to live and stay with the PGA Tour. What is their standing or their causes of action if they're not if this merger goes through and they're not comfortable that they were put in the appropriate financial position by the PGA's merger to sue the PGA Tour? Um, and what would their causes of action be? I mean, part of the problem, right, is we don't have their membership agreements with the tour to know what rights they would have. No, but I'm even curious, aside from their legal rights, just personal rights. I mean, I know that the PGA kind of put Rory out there as the spokesman for some of their publicity and marketing against Liv when some of the his colleagues were being recruited. And, you know, to his credit, he was, um, I think, very respectful the entire time that this debate was going on and was very vocal on behalf of the PGA and loyal to the PGA. So now you have what is arguably one of the, the greatest employment moves by some of the other players and that they abandoned ship, um, got multi-figure, multi-million figure signing bonuses for it. And now they're being put right back in the PGA where their colleagues who stood by the, the company, um, stayed the whole time. So to me, it's almost a personal affront and I'm kind of curious now that I'm involved in this, now that David got me involved in this un unwillingly, um, to see what kind of statements come from some of those loyal PGA players um, in their stance, even if it isn't escalated to a legal statement yet. Um, again, I agree with David as I think that that is certainly something that they're probably going to explore um, to make sure that they're on the same footing compensation-wise. Yeah, I think the interesting thing is really going to be to see what Tiger and Rory say. Um, for not to discredit some of the other prominent stores like Jordan Spieth or Justin Thomas, but I would say that out of the last year and a half in issues with Liv, that Tiger and Rory really did sort of step up to the plate for better or worse, no matter what your opinion is on Liv or the PGA and all that drama, because there's lots of opinions. I mean, you could say to Rory's credit, there's tons of people out there hitting Rory, saying that his position's ridiculous for attacking these people to go to live and get paid and take a take a payday. And if you just think about it in a purely non like golf emotional standpoint, like you're at a job and another company comes and says, "That's take more money." <laughs> yeah, here's a hundred million dollars guaranteed. Um, are you going to really have the moral fortitude to say, <laughs> well, five percent of your holdings are by the PIF, and I have moral objections, you know? So I still take Ubers, <laughs> so that's okay. <laughs> well, and obviously, like the Uber, like the all that's a little different, right? Because the Ubers and all the world are publicly traded companies; they can't really stop an accredited investor from buying their stock on the exchange unless that investor is blocked. But anyway, not to go down a rabbit hole. It's going to be interesting to see what Tiger and Rory say and what they do and whether or not I'm also assuming as we talk about like there's lawyers at the Department of Justice talking about antitrust law and whether they're going to try to stop this. There's also antitrust private lawyers who are probably courting the kind of players who can afford a million, two or three million dollar legal bill like Jordan Spieth or Justin Thomas or Tiger or Rory and saying you have legal standing, you should file suit to stop it if you want. And that's another interesting legal avenue is like, as I thought about this topic and, and read all the articles I was reading to prepare for our discussion, what players may or may not have legal standing to file a lawsuit on antitrust grounds and stop it. Ultimately, right, like we just said, it's really tough to give a legal opinion on what their standing may be and what their rights may be without knowing what their players' contracts say with the PGA Tour. Well, and another reason I think we'd be curious to see what it says, and I did not realize this, but until, again, looking into this to talk about the podcast today, but PGA is player run. Um, and so I didn't really understand what that meant in that context, but in looking into it more in depth, it means that they have a lot of say in the in the competitions that they participate in, the, decision, the decisions of the PGA. And as far as I know, this deal was generated without the input of the players who supposedly run the PGA. It was. Um, yeah. And I'm kind of interested <laughs> to see some of the backlash. You know, some of the players were already using social media to comment 
um, you know, a little bit passively aggressively about how they found out about the deal going through, <laughs> which I thought was interesting as well. Um, just in that if they are supposed to be involved in these decisions and now all of a sudden you have a merger which creates this this one entity, if you will, um, with the exclusive investor being PIF. Um, and I also read that PIF also has in the deal that PIF negotiated the first right of refusal for investments, for future investments. So I thought that was very interesting and to see how this merger deal is going to be written not only in the context of what the DOJ is going to be interested in regulating, but also what the individual players of the player-run PGA, how that's going to translate to this new organization to see if those things are going to stay consistent, essentially. And that's an interesting point you made about the right of first refusal and future investment, because this kind of came up in me discussing it um, yesterday evening with a close friend of mine from the standpoint of, Will the SEC, the Security and Exchange Commission, or the DOJ make decisions on trying to kill it based upon – so now it's being proposed as PIF being the minority owner, so they're not having control. But it's almost like one of those things where you're going to let the fox in the hen house because then how much leverage do they have to stop a Saudi Arabian entity from controlling the PGA Tour of America in future deals once they've gotten a significant chunk of ownership. And so I think those are the considerations that and the discussions that will be happening at the DOJ and the SEC related to the merger. But I also don't rule out that there will be private lawsuits filed by the players. And that could be very interesting. I did have to giggle when I looked at I mean, you know, I love dry humor. And you're talking about the players being like sarcastic on social media. And I think the funniest thing, at least that I saw, I was scanning it quickly um, to see what some player reaction was, is Max Homa, who's in the top 10 in the FedEx standings right now and a popular social media guy. He said, and who has been an outspoken critic of Liv, said something along the lines of, and now that we're all friends, because they have not all been friends and they've been fighting for like two years, can we go back to um, can we go back to workshopping this these team names? Because Liv has the team names, and he's got like the screenshot of the Google search. What is a clique? Because it's like <laughs> <laughs> the Liv team names are like ridiculous. Some of them I don't even know what it means. So I thought that was pretty just funny and humorous. But um, the, the player reaction is going to be fascinating. But as a lawyer, right, I am like really interested to see both on the private lawsuits and the government potential lawsuits and regulatory actions like how is this whole melting pot of personal opinions geopolitical issues antitrust law golf saudi arabia is a lot to unfold before this whole merger goes through and it's going to be until one of my friends who asked me about it yesterday i said just get your popcorn ready it's going to be interesting that it is <laughs> and as a mom i'm going to be interested to see if my little one is going to play golf now <laughs> for those well, sign-in bonuses he if might he have does if he does your husband will be happy with me i know that all right so i'm going to kick it over to you now caitlin what topic do you have for us today so, David, when I was looking into this, um, I, you may or may not be familiar with this as much as I was familiar with golf, but one of the most popular athletic brands, I'm sure a lot of our female listeners are familiar with it, is Lululemon. Um, if you are not familiar, Lululemon is kind of, I don't want to say new on the scene anymore, but within the past five to seven years, really kind of changed the way that women view athleisure. Um, if you're even familiar with that. I thought you were going to say, when you said, if you weren't familiar with I thought you were going to say expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it is It is not economically priced, I will say that much. <laughs> and when it hit the market, that was one of the areas that um, people were shocked that you would spend upwards of, you know, 90 to $100 on what is essentially workout gear. But it kind of changed the landscape of how men and women both approach athleisure and, and what's more acceptable. And throughout the course of COVID, I think um, people got away with it a lot more because it's looked at as, as more of an outfit. Um, I know for one, it's really what I hang out in on the weekends and haven't braved it to wear to work yet, but I just might. Um, but one, Lululemon is actually coming under fire lately um, because of a recent theft Unfortunately, that's not something we here in New Orleans are immune to. Um, in one of their Georgia locations, they are loca located in a very high-end shopping area, and they had a string of thefts, um, presumably from similar similar thieves, if you will, um, over the course of several weeks. The thefts happened on seven to ten different occasions, and two of their employees 
um, actually in this particular case were fired for engaging in the theft. So apparently Lululemon, um, along with a lot of other big name retailers, have what's called a zero tolerance theft policy. And it's not what caught my attention. What I thought was interesting about this is when you think zero tolerance theft policy, what I automatically thought is it means we have no tolerance. We have no tolerance for theft. We will stop any and all thieves. Well, it's quite the opposite. Um, come to find out, the zero to zero tolerance theft policy means that they do not prevent the theft in their retail outlets. Um, and so initially, it's it, it sounds crazy, right? Why would they have this kind of policy? Why would other international retailer stores have this similar policy? But they are putting safety of their employees at the forefront of the theft. The CEO, Calvin McDonald, um, has stood by the firing of the two Lululemon employees in saying that they, because of their policy, and because they have such a strong interest in furthering this policy, um, they are standing by the firing of these two employees. It's not because the employees called 911. Um, it is because they engaged in the theft. And Lulu's Lemon, Lululemon's policy is that they put the safety of their employees and their customers at the forefront. Um, he was quoted as saying, look, you know, do we, do we promote theft? No, but it's just merchandise at the end of the day. What did that, I had this question as I kind of like was briefly reading about this. What did they do? So the thieves in this particular instance ran in to one of the, you know, the stores are beautifully arranged, obviously, to catch your eye and make because you want to spend. Because uh, it's expensive. Right. <laughs> um, they make you think that you need to spend $100 on workout gear, even though you don't work out. But um, so they, the store is arranged in a way that you have some some displays up front. So the thieves ran into the front doors of the store, grabbed the merchandise off the front and ran right back out. Um, and this has happened in this particular store and what this whole issue like, centers what, what did the, I don't want to interrupt you, what did the employees do? So this is the situation. Right. What are they are supposed to do, according to Lululemon's policy, is nothing. They are supposed to wait until the theft is completed and then call 911 to not scare the customers, not put themselves or the customers' lives at danger. In this particular case, um, the two employees who were terminated have done some local interviews and whatnot, and it appears that they kind of, I don't want to say chased the employee, the, the thieves, but said, hey, stop right there, just go ahead and get out of the store. But it's because these particular thieves had been in the store on numerous occasions mm -hmm. um, within a short amount of time. And so Lululemon is taking the position that that engagement with the thieves is against their policy, which puts customers and employees' safety at the forefront. Um, and interestingly enough, David, I looked into some of the other stores that have this policy. Um, and what's surprising about it is that it's because of instances that employees have basically involved themselves in these in these thefts, if you will, um, and have been injured, drastically so in some circumstances. So there is actually a bill being passed in the California State Senate right now that prohibits employers from even suggesting that their employees engage or involve themselves in, in thefts um, because of the consequences of what can happen. What basically is the issue here is what's called a shrink. That's a term that's used in retail therapy outlets to assign a loss value to theft, fraud, employee mistake, things like that. And shockingly, it is worth an annual $94.5 billion right now. Wow. Um, which is these retailers are going to have to figure out a way to go about this. And these policies are an attempt, I don't think, to stop the theft, but to place their employees' safety at a higher priority than this shrink rate, um, which I thought was was absolutely crazy to say that this is how much is being is being stolen on an annual basis. Um, That's an insane amount of money. And I guess one, one thing our listeners are probably thinking right away is, what is somebody's legal option if they are terminated from the outside? Looks like a good deed or having some courage to try to stop somebody who's committing a crime. And I can just say from the Louisiana standpoint, most of the time, these retail workers who are in a store um, doing this type of, of work, they are considered at-will employees, meaning 
an employer can terminate an at-will employee for any reason whatsoever under Louisiana law, which is not a discriminatory purpose, meaning age, race, a sexual orientation, whatever is protected by the ADA. So depending upon the laws there, and I think you said the stores in Georgia, it's likely, I'm assuming, that Lululemon has no legal liability for terminating them for this, especially if it's in contravention of their employment policies. But I guess it does raise like a larger societal like legal issue, which is, are they encouraging theft by the thieves knowing that they have a no engagement policy? Well, and what are the consequences of those types of bills, right? And that's kind of crazy because if you know if you've looked into this kind of thing, you'll see that there there are strings of thefts, whether on a small scale or large scale. They're called, um, I think, b- blast robberies, where you have. 10 to 12 people go into a high-end luxury store and steal handbags off the shelves that are worth several thousand dollars a piece. And so they end up running out of one store with, you know, thousands of dollars worth worth of inventory versus, you know, a smaller scale like the Lululemon theft where they probably walked out with, oh, I don't know, $900 worth of spandex pants. (laughs) Um, And things like that are being sold on the black market. But one of the interesting things that I think that stores are trying to do – you know, and this kind of goes back to one of our previous podcasts, if you all haven't listened to it, Brad mentioned AI and how that is having its place in, you know, various industries. And this is a industry where we are starting to see AI, which I thought was interesting. So Lowe's, in fact, has a a a trial run where they are using AI robots in one of their Philadelphia locations. So the AI robots are not only being used to help cater to some of the theft, um, but they're also being used, as you can probably assume, um, to gather customer data. So mm. these AI robots have are on a 24-hour camera spool to monitor what's going on in the store. They take thermal imaging. They scan license plates in the cars. That's all more towards the theft component, but they also monitor what customers are wearing, their shopping habits, things like that all at the same time. So this is something where some of the retailers are being are looking to implement this as as a theft reduction. Um, I don't think it's it's such it's in its infancy stages right now, so I don't really see how that's worked out. Um, I guess I have some healthy skepticism. Are they using the AI for theft reduction or are they using the AI to collect more customer data with a veneer of theft reduction to, <laughs> to I, limit the, I the would blowback? Assume both. <laughs> but I, you know, one thing I have that, th- to, that comes to mind for me is if there are going to be tons of laws enacted which prevent companies from having policies which allow employees to try to stop theft, right? It's one thing for Lululemon to take this position and seemingly say they're trying to protect the employees and, you know, it's just inventory. Now, Lululemon is one of the higher end type of sportswear brands, right? Like, and so I would assume have higher margins. Maybe it costs them ten dollars landed to do a piece of spandex that they'll sell for ninety or a hundred dollars. So I'm just taking a guess. So I'm assuming they have much higher margins than a lot of people in retail. And so how does that really impact people with less margin and the companies and the small businesses who pay more distributors and middlemen that cuts into the margin before the final product goes out? Like how do they afford to stay in business if? if a law goes into effect of that nature and prevents them from trying to interrupt and stop theft. And then they, then it, you know, it just kind of happens. These, you know, what you call the, the string of robberies happen more and more. If there's, that's a potential corollary effect. Like, could it put businesses out of business? It can. And now that, you know, when you say that and speaking about this topic with a friend of mine, you know, when you think about it on a local level, you know, there's a lot of small businesses, especially here in New Orleans, and that's something I always try to support and whatnot. And interestingly <laughs> enough, there was an incident several months ago with a local business um, located right here on Magazine Street, so a boutique business, who, like David said, probably had lower margin and is more dependent upon their individual sales. And so they encountered a situation in which there was a robbery, a blast robbery, where several individuals walked into the store, tried to steal merchandise, um, and quint- Incidentally, one of their store managers had a military background um, and so got involved in the theft and was able to stop the theft, essentially. Um, And then there was also a off-premises security guard who got involved as well. 
And so the manager took a step back and, you know, let the let the law enforcement do what the law enforcement was being paid to do. But unfortunately, one of the thieves got a hold of the law enforcement officer's weapon and started to use it on the crowd in in the area, which is a very right. for those of you who aren't familiar with Magazine Street, it's a it's a mixed commercial and residential area. And so there's at any given time, there's a lot of people walking up and down it. It's, a, you know, it's a very popular area for tourists. And so that is a dynamic that I think the local stores are going to have to look into. And fortunately for that particular store, just given the background of, of that individual employee, he was able to stop it in action. But, right. you know, I don't think that that's an option for everybody, given just who the demographics are of the employees or the um, or the customers. And so that's something they're going to have to look at. And I don't know whether or not we're going to be seeing robots running up and down Magazine Street anytime soon. But <laughs> well, it's all, And it's also, we haven't even hit on how that affects a business who has lower margins. That isn't like a sportswear, retail, clothing that may have higher margins, like a restaurant uh, or a bar if they're caught up in more of that and they have no ability to try and stop it on a proactive Standpoint, but it is really interesting because we have not talked about yet. And you're right, all the discussions that we've had about AI technology and its implementation in different businesses and industries, we really haven't hit on how is AI going to be used to collect and collate customer information and data along with potentially security, um, whether it be cybersecurity or theft security in this context. And Facebook and Zoom and, and all these different companies who have had repeated data security and privacy issues. Right? Absolutely. And it's interesting that you say that because I'm in given the context of using AI, which, you know, David knows me personally, I'm terrified about it and, and working very hard to implement into my practice. Um, but I am less hesitant when it's used in something like this, like in a security basis. You know, for instance, we here at the firm have um, everybody's familiar with hurricanes and what happens during hurricanes and during Ida, the city of New Orleans itself and the surrounding areas um, unfortunately lost power for a significant period of time. And so we here at the firm have clientele who their commercial businesses were actually subject to robberies during Ida. And so, for instance, if, if there was a widespread adoption of these AI robots for security purposes um, that are not run on electricity, you know, what's to say that the, the robots couldn't be standing outside the store during the loss of energy to monitor the store. And so that's something that we're helping our clients overcome, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, to say that there's a balance there between the use of AI and providing security measures that even might help mitigate some of these detrimental losses to these business owners, um, I think that's going to be an interesting dynamic to watch how it plays out. Yeah, and it's an application I hadn't really thought about, but we are seeing that debate in the public um, spill out from people like Elon Musk calling. We've talked about calling for tighter regulation. And there is like a concern with AI, like it is a slippery slope. Where does it stop? We have to harness the technology and have controls in place to where we don't have like a iRobot um, situation where we're <laughs> the inferior race. That's all I think of every time. <laughs> so it will be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, really interesting topic with Lululemon. Um, but well, all right. Great topic, Caitlin. Um, I think we've had some really interesting topics today talking about both the PGA Tour, DP World Tour, and Live Golf Merger along with Lululemon's theft issues. Well, and it goes to show our listeners that law is really involved in everything from <laughs> spandex to golf. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I mean, my, my key takeaway from the PGA Tour discussion is like, stay tuned. Like, let's see what the Department of Justice, what the SEC, and what private lawsuits may fly out there from players who may or may not have standing to try to challenge this proposed merger. It hasn't reached the finish line yet. It's just proposed. Um, to try to stop it or if they are going to wait to file after. My guess is somebody's going to try to stop it and file ahead of time if there is going to be any significant player in that world to try and stop it on antitrust ground. So it is going to be interesting to watch that play out. Everybody should look out for that. And on the Lululemon thing, my big takeaway, um, and I'll let you kind of give yours, is is to see how AI technology is going to imp be implemented for security measures and what laws to be looking out for related to the state, whether it be individual state governments regulate empl employers being able to let employees get involved and stop theft. Sure, sure. And I think I, for 
Given my um, my knowledge of golf prior to this, I would say that my takeaway from the PGA Live merger is that it, it interests a whole new generation of non-golfers, if you will, to kind of follow along and see what happens. I mean, it, it takes golf um, to a whole nother level and a business perspective that I think some of us haven't given it credit for beforehand. And so, um, you know, maybe there'll be a Bravo spinoff before we know. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll see a whole new demographic of followers. I don't, I don't see Andy it. Cohen really uh, uh, oh, you might biting his teeth into Vignere. the golf tour. <laughs> I'm waiting to see the, the housewives of the live tour coming on play. <laughs> <laughs> um, which also interests me in Lululemon. I'm interested to see how that works out. And and like I think everybody, I'm kind of on, um, you know, cautious but excited about AI to see how this can possibly help or hurt businesses, and especially here locally in New Orleans and our and our clients that we help represent. So if there's, I'm liking to see how, how that plays out. Awesome. Well, thanks for being here, Caitlin. Thanks for co-hosting with me. Can't wait to have you back. We'll have you back very shortly. Thanks, Brad, for going to Italy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and and so, uh, you know, I will say a much more positive topic than Brad. He's usually like scaring people on this show. So it's been nice to have a refreshing topic from you and have you help me co-host the show. Thanks to all our listeners. Thanks for being with us. I hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Once again, this has been the Overall Podcast brought to you by the Scott Vignair Law Firm. Can't wait to see you next time. And we'll talk to you later. Thanks, all. Scott Vignair, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action.